Please welcome to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. David Mills. Thank you very much. It is difficult to say bifidobacteria. Uh, uh, it's a joy to be here. Uh, the last time I was in this building was uh, about seven years ago. There was a conference held here uh, run by a couple of, of mentors of mine, one by the name of, of Jeff Gordon, a famous professor from uh, University of uh, Washington, and, uh, or WashU, and, and Todd Clanhammer, who's another famous uh, researcher microbiologist at NC State. And they were both sitting here, and it just reminded me of seven years ago to be able to give a talk in this room again. So it's wonderful to be back. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk today uh, about milk and microbes and mammals, as the title indicates. And I'll do my best to not get too wonky into the, uh, some of the specifics of the research that we do. But I like to, st I like to start this out. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I have to start this out with my disclosures, uh, uh, as I should. Uh, and, the, and the main disclosure that I want to point out is some data at the very end of this from Evolve Biosystems, which is a company we, I, I helped co-found uh, that relates to the subject matter uh, uh, that I'll be talking about today. They've done a clinical trial that I'm going to show some data from. But when you think about foods, uh, you have to th you, we want to ask a question. If you're, in, if you're interested in understanding what foods are, make you healthy, uh, one question to ask is, did any food evolve to make you healthy? I mean, we all know that these particular foods, as much as you may like or not like to eat them, uh, are healthy foods. Those are foods that we all should be eating more. But they didn't specifically evolve to make humans healthy. They evolved for their own purposes. Humans might have domesticated them, uh, but, but they evolved for their own purposes. There really is only one food that co-evolved with humans to make humans healthy, and that, of course, is human milk. Um, now, depending on who you talk to, uh, the evolution of mammals and, and milk itself is, is at least 200 to 400 million years ago old, depending on how you want to talk about it. And it evolved under amazing constraints. So we, we all know that milk, particularly human milk, provides the, the complete nourishment for the infant. The infant does not need anything else. So the milk is providing everything that infant needs. But if you think about how this might have evolved over the last millions of years, every bit of energy that a mom is giving away is at risk to that mom. Every bit of energy and protection that the infant is not getting is at risk to that infant. So you have opposing evolutionary forces on this fluid. And that's represented, in a sense, by this, what they call this parent-offspring conflict. So that over time, anything that allows mom to put out less energy but still provide the infant with the same nutrients and the same protection is going to be rigorously saved. And anything that is superfluous to the infant's uh, nutrition and protection is going to be called out. And we can make that hi hypothesis, at least, over evolutionary time. So one would predict that the components of human milk <coughs> might have many, many functions. You would build a, a molecule once, but that molecule might have seven different functions because you save the energy of just making it once. And that's the genius of milk. There's a lot of complex uh, components of milk. We're still trying to understand it. It's one of the least studied human fluids. You should do a PubMed search on serum or plasma versus milk, and you'll, you'll find out that uh, milk is not, uh, uh, particularly human milk, is not studied as much given how important it is. Um, and, a, and a friend of mine, uh, Bruce German at, at UC Davis, likes to point out that uh, this might have something to do with the fact that uh, most of NIH is focused and has been focused on, on white men with my uh, certain size uh, uh, for many, many years, and therefore breast milk is just not something that's really been on the, on the docket of NIH for a long time. But I, I think that's changing a lot lately, and that's wonderful. So 
If milk feeds the baby, which we know, does it also feed that other organism that lives with us, and that's considered our microbiota? Now, you might have heard this uh, certainly in the press recently. Uh, in the last, really, 10 years, there has been an explosion of research in trying to understand the microbes, the bacteria, the viruses, the, the, the fungi that live on and in us. And particularly, folks are focused on your GI tract, because it turns out your GI tract harbors huge numbers of microbes, huge numbers of microbes, and they're terribly important in processing your food. So if milk feeds the baby from a nutrient standpoint, is it also feeding the microbes? Or better yet, does it farm the microbes? Because a baby is born, uh, this is a bit of an oxymoron, reasonably sterile. It's kind of like a little bit pregnant. Uh, uh, babies are born uh, with a low number of microbes associated with them, and as soon as they're brought forth into this world, all of the microbes from their environment start to, to populate both the insides and the outsides of their body. And of course, they start nursing, and, and milk itself has organisms associated with it, the origin of which is somewhat controversial, but certainly it is from the mother, the mother's skin. Um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a term that, that, uh, that some of us use, uh, we live in a fecal veneer. Uh, and so you can imagine where some of the organisms might come from uh, that make it into the baby. Um, so uh, there's many ways that a baby could be colonized. The insides of the GI tract of a baby could be colonized. Um, but does milk feed that population? And more importantly, does it maybe direct that population? So what's, what's in human milk? Uh, it's pretty simple. Most of it's, oops, most of it's water. And there's a variety of macro and micronutrients of which most of that is lactose. Now, we, many people know lactose is the main disaccharide that's in both bovine milk and human milk, any kind of milk. Uh, and it's uh, actually aimed at the, the baby. So it's aimed at the neonate. It provides energy for the neonate, as do, do these lipids, which are fats, which is critical nutrients for the baby. There's a whole bunch of proteins uh, and the proteins are also nutrients for the baby, but there are also some bioactive proteins that I'll talk about that do specific functions. And then there's this class of things we call human milk oligosaccharides. And this is fiber, just as you think the kind of fiber that we're all supposed to be eating. Uh, there are some oligosaccharides that are very complex that human milk has a huge amount of. Uh, actually, some, by some measurements, the, the HMOs are the third largest constituent uh, in human breast milk. And that's going to be a fascinating uh, point uh, as we walk down this path a little bit. So most of this stuff is, excuse me, most of this stuff is food for the baby. But it, there's also aspects that help farm the developing infant gut. And, and some of those are, are items that, that you might have heard of and, we, and, and, and people know about. So, for instance, there's antibodies, immunoglobulins, in, in milk. Lysozyme is, a, is a, an anti, uh, uh, or antimicrobial protein that's in milk. Lactoferrin is another one. There's some fatty acids that are antimicrobial. So mother's milk is putting antimicrobial stuff into the GI tract of the baby to suppress certain populations of microbes to farm what's there. It wants certain things perhaps to grow, and others certainly like pathogens not to grow. Now, these human milk oligosaccharides come in a whole bunch of different flavors. They're very complex sugars. They're, 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 they're linkages of different monomers. So here are the different monomers, and we don't, it doesn't really matter what they are at this point, but they're all linked in many different ways and uh, there's a whole bunch of different forms. Sometimes they're free, most of them are free, but they're also connected to lipids or they're connected to proteins. Uh, and mother's milk, mothers are delivering huge amounts of this into their babies. And the interesting thing about this slide is all the little numbers here, 
are all these linkages below here. These numbers represent these enzymes. These are all enzymes that are needed to break that bond. All of these enzymes are not expressed by the baby. So the baby's DNA does not express all these enzymes to break down all of this stuff in its GI tract. That would suggest that the microbes that actually are able to do that could grow on this stuff. And so one of the concepts of what is the utility of this fiber is that it's, it's encouraging a beneficial population of microbes inside a baby. Okay. I talked before about the multiplicity of function of the components of milk. Well, it turns out that's really true for these fibers in milk as well. This is a, a wonderful slide by uh, a colleague at, at uh, uh, UC San Diego, Lars Bode, who, who just shows all the different functions that these human milk oligosaccharides do. And I, I won't go into the details of all these different things. One of them is pretty easy to figure out. These human milk oligosaccharides look a lot like the oligosaccharides that sit on your epithelium inside your gut. So if you have a bacteria swimming along and it wants to bind to your gut, it has to bind to that epithelial glycan. Well, if, if mother's milk is flooding all of the same type of glycan through the GI tract, maybe the little E. coli that's swimming along will bind that instead of you and then get flushed out. And so the idea is it just acts as a decoy. Um, there's a variety of other uh, interactions, and I, again, I won't go through all of these, uh, but to talk about the one that, that has a term that you might have heard called prebiotics. Now, prebiotics are the kinds of fibers that they add to yogurts and a lot of foods that you might eat. And the goal of a prebiotic is to enrich a healthy microbiome in your gut. Um, and, and so maybe HMOs have a prebiotic function, and that's what my lab and some others at UC Davis have been studying for about 15 years now. So if milk farms a good microbiota inside a baby, what at least used to be the, the microbes that would populate breastfed infants? This is, a, this is something we can actually look back in history because people, geez, more than 100 years ago have looked at breastfed infant feces under a microscope. And, and uh, uh, a quite famous French pediatrician, Tissier, uh, looked at breastfed infant feces under the microscope quite a long time ago, 1905 is when he published this, and noticed a whole bunch, almost a, a domination of these Y-shaped bacteria. He called them bacterium bifidus, but it was completely dominated. And other uh, microscopic analysis at the time, maybe even a few years later, of infants that were fed bovine milk, that were not breastfed but fed bovine milk, noticed that there was a mixed population. So it didn't look like, like a, a human milk breastfed baby. So that was one indication way long time ago. Subsequently, a few years later, uh, they started measuring the acidity of the poops, of the infant poops that were breastfed. And they noticed that the infants started off at around pH 6, but after a couple of days after, after breastfeeding, boom, it went way down to 4-5. And, and, and those kids that got the cow's milk, it stayed up at 6. So we have a fermentation going on. They understood that at the time. There must be some sort of fermentation going on. And they, there must be something in breast milk that's getting fermented. They pretty much came to that conclusion at the time. Now, I present this old data because I'm going to show some data of what do kids look like today, a little bit later. And it's a bit shocking. Things have changed in 100 years. So what do kids look like today in other parts of the world. So this is a cohort of children that we profiled in Bangladesh and in, in the Gambia. And I, I'm just going to explain, these are, we're, we're, we're profiling using very modern DNA sequencing tools, the, the organisms that are present in the baby poop. In this case, we sampled, what is it, 48 kids, 
uh, and and we, we, we examined via DNA sequencing their baby poop, and that can tell us what organisms are present. And we can, we can create these little stack plots. So mostly this phylum of organism is present in this particular kid at this time. And then another one shows up a little bit later. And so you can get an idea of the complexity of the microbial populations in these children as they're developing. Here are the kids in the Gambia. And you, you notice that there's a big domination of one type. And that is mostly these bifidobacteria. It subsequently was called bifidobacterium for the Y-shaped bacterium. And we are able to type these strains much further nowadays than they certainly they could 100 years ago. Uh, in particular, in these two places, these kids are dominated by one subspecies, Bifidobacterium longum subspecies infantis. And every time when we go out in the, in, to kids in various parts of uh, the developing world, we notice that when they're dominated by Bifidobacteria, they tend to be dominated by this subspecies. So, if bifidobacteria are associated with a healthy kid, uh, or associated with our kids, is it associated with health? Well, there's been a variety of studies of bifidobacteria because bifidobacteria are used as probiotics. Those are the kind of probiotics that they add to your yogurts. So there's been a lot of clinical studies done on different bifidobacteria to try to understand how they might be benefiting uh, your gut and your health. Um, one of the studies uh, that, that I show here a couple of years ago is really a wonderful study. A Japanese group was rotating different bifidobacteria in a mouse model. Basically, we're feeding mice different bifidobacteria, and then they were challenging the mice with a, with a pathogenic E. coli. And the mice that survived, they figured, must have had the better bifidobacteria to, to ward off the E. coli infection. So then they studied it a bit further and noticed those bifidobacteria that could colonize the mice and produce and ferment and produce the acid end products that bifidobacteria produce could effectively prevent the E. coli from gaining a foothold. So growth in that spot, just the simple growth of the bacteria, simple fermentation in that spot. In this case, they were fermenting the mouse chow. It wasn't breast milk. Uh, so they designed a probiotic that works really well if you want to eat mouse chow. Uh, but, but it, the concept was, was, was presented, and it was a really wonderful paper. In those same Bangladeshi kids that I showed you before, we should, uh, our group with uh, uh, Charles Stevenson at, at, at uh, uh, the Ag Research Service, USDA Ag Research Service, it also coincides with UC Davis, demonstrated that the vaccine response for the children in the first year of life, the vaccine response that they got for a variety of different vaccines that they got, correlated with the amount of bifidobacteria they had earlier in life. So if they were dominated by bifidobacteria, their vaccine response was more robust. If they had a mixed population, their vaccine response was less. So this early colonization appeared to be at least associated with health. Now, we've, we've actually done a, a study on this uh, further. This was the original study we published in 90 or excuse me, in 2004, we now have 250 children, I think, and the, the population looks very similar to this in terms of the microbiota complexity, and in other words, it's mostly dominated by bifidobacteria, but there's a bunch of kids that don't, aren't dominated. And we sampled it the same 6, 11, and 15 weeks, but we also sampled it two years. And they looked at vaccine response at two years. Turns out the vaccine response at two years is correlated to the amount of bifidobacteria in the child at these earlier stages. So there's an association. Um, this is an, an un, some unpublished data showing a certain kind of immune response that would suggest that you're getting a positive response, a vaccination response. Um, and this, this is really interesting because two years is a long time. Uh, the, ki the children have developed other microbes in their gut since that time. But this early critical stage must have something to do with sort of positioning the child in the right way to develop an immune system correctly. And so it's a very exciting result because maybe we can help children who are, for instance, in this category uh, by putting the right probiotic in. 
Okay. I, I, always, I, always, I always have this slide up here. Uh, always be wary, particularly of professors in general, but uh, certainly spouting associations. Uh, and I, I, am, I am the Shields Endowed Chair, the Peter J. Shields Endowed Chair of Dairy Food Science. So I had to find an interesting association. So here's an interesting association. Uh, and, and you can go to this website and you can find all sorts of interesting associations. But this is one, since often I give talks before, when prior to the talks people have had a little bit of wine and cheese, so they've had some cheese before they come and listen to the talk. Uh, this is an association with cheese consumption, is associated with number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Now, I can promise you, as the Shields Endowed Chair in Dairy Food Science, that cheese is not going to cause you to become tangled in your bedsheets and, and die. This is just uh, an association, and we have to be wary of associations when, as scientists, because we see them all the time, and they might be as ludicrously associated as this. So we need mechanism. We need, we need to understand what, what are bifidobacteria doing and how are they possibly benefiting these children. Well, we've been trying to study that for the last 15 years, and there's a, there's a bunch of research that has advanced this, but I don't mean to indicate in any way that we are completely there. This is a long path. Uh, trying to understand how bifidobacteria early at six weeks leads to a better vaccination response at two years is a complex question. So we're working through that, that understanding. So one question we wanted to ask is, okay, if bifidobacteria are good and they're showing up in, in some infants and we know that there's a lot of human milk oligosaccharides going into those infants, uh, are the two associated? In other words, are the bifidobacteria eating the human milk oligosaccharides and fermenting them? So we've done a lot of study in this area, uh, and uh, I, I am really fortunate to be able to work with an amazing glycochemist by the name of Carlita Labria, who really invented whole new tools to be able to see these complex human milk oligosaccharides, and they are really complex. So this, he really created a whole new field in this process. And one of the things he can do is he can actually take the milk from a mom, and the poop from the baby and tell me which oligosaccharides are missing in the poop that was originally there in the milk. And then I can use these new DNA sequencing tools to try to look at what microbes are in the babies and say, okay, when the, when the oligosaccharides are gone, these kind of microbes are there, and when the oligosaccharides are flushing out the other end of the kid, uh, a different set of microbes are there. We can do that kind of associate, association. And we've done that a bunch of times. And one of the things we noticed is a certain type of oligosaccharides, these are non-fucosylated, so it's a certain cluster of, of these oligosaccharides, or the fucosylated ones, seem to disappear in infants that have high bifidobacteria. So we just segregated the infants on whether they had a lot of bifidobacteria or a really low amount, and then just asked the question, how many of these oligos are still left in their poop? And so that correlates and made sense. And the fermentation end product of that fermentation is lactate. So we also measured lactate, and we found the opposite. In the kids that had a lot of uh, bifidobacteria, there was a lot more lactate. In other words, they fermented the human milk oligosaccharides and produced lactate. It's one of the end products. So, so this is still associative data, but we're now taking a step closer to try to understand a mechanism. All right. so. We have to get into these oligosaccharides in human milk uh, by understanding how do the bifidobacteria actually degrade them. That's really an important point, because we want to understand how those bifidobacteria establish a niche and grow. Um, so we want to know, are they selective? If only bifidobacteria are growing in these breastfed kids, there's a lot of other bacteria that are not growing. So I should be able to take these human milk oligosaccharides and throw them at some bifidobacteria, and they should grow like crazy. And then I should throw them at E. coli, and it shouldn't grow at all, uh, perhaps. So, so when I say human milk oligosaccharides, I'm really talking about lots of different structures. This is a cartoon that kind of represents both the quantity and, and different types of structures that are present, in this case, in a, in a more common uh, genotype of milk. Uh, we call it a secretor, and I'd be happy to talk about that later. 
Um, and there are different types of oligosaccharides, whether they have a fucose, if they have a fucose, they're red. If they have a sialic acid uh, uh, here, they're yellow. And the ones that have neither a sialic acid or a fucose are white. And so, so if you're a microbe and you're growing in the colon of an infant, this is what you're going to see as food. And so this is what you got to eat. Lactose is going to be consumed by the child upstream. So we purified human milk oligosaccharides. We've gotten lots of human milk. We've had up to 200 gallons of human milk where we purify these oligosaccharides from. Um, and we tested different bifidobacteria that are famously associated with breastfed infants. And we just asked, can you grow on the human milk oligosaccharides? And this is, these are some of the organisms that are commonly found. Really, the first three are most commonly found in breastfed infants around the world. Um, maybe you could include the fourth, B. bifidum, as well. Uh, these, are, these are frequently found, but not dominant. Uh, this is an adult bifidobacteria. And this is one that, uh, how do I say this, Jamie Lee Curtis sells uh, in her yogurt commercials. So that's the probiotic. Uh, in, in that yogurt commercial. Uh, it, it's actually, uh, oh, sorry. So we tested to see whether they grow on these human milk oligosaccharides. And, and you can see the results here. Every single B. infantis, we call it B. infantis, grows on HMOs. Not every single isolate of B. longum or every single isolate of B. Brev breve grew, so those are variable with a V. Most of the B. bifidums grow on HMOs and occasional pseudocatenolatums. We haven't tested catenolatum yet. If you ask which organism consumes all of the HMOs, that whole pile, everything, there's only one, and that's the B. infantis. So it can, it can vacuum up everything that moms are delivering. So how do they consume this? You have a bacterium, and you have a very complex oligosaccharide outside the bacterium. H how do they break this down? How do they eat it? We need to understand that mechanism, because it'll help us understand why they're dominating in that niche. Well, we sequenced the genome of B. infantis uh, quite a few years ago now, actually before I gave my last talk here. Uh, and we've characterized all of the genes that we have found that were necessary for growing on human milk oligosaccharides. And it was easier than we thought because we're all in one big cluster. And that one big cluster of genes had every kind of enzyme or transporter needed to take those big human milk oligosaccharides into the cell. And then you would pick them apart by various enzymes once you're in the cell so you could metabolize it. So there's transporters that take them in, and once they get into the cell, there's various enzymes that cleave, cleave it apart, and, and basically it's just food for the bacteria. It can grow on it. So I like to, I like to look at this because it's really, somehow you've got to get this big oligosaccharide in, inside the cell, and you're not chewing it apart outside of the cell, even a little bit. And that's an, going to be an important point. Because there's, there's different strategies that microbes in your gut use for dealing with these complex fibers. And a, and a different strategy uh, by another species that's very famously show, showing up in some infants, but certainly in adults, is what I call an outside eater strategy. So it takes a complex oligosaccharide like this, and it has enzymes on the outside of the cell that break it up into pieces. And then it pretty much takes in the pieces at once and leaves the other pieces behind. Whereas the infant-born bifidobacteria take the whole thing inside. Well, that's a different competitive strategy. If you're leaving food behind, somebody else is going to come along and eat it. So it's a different strategy. So do we see evidence of this kind of either domination of a niche because they're not leaving any food behind, or cross-feeding potentially other organisms in babies? And is that related to their health status? Well, so what happens if neonates are colonized by what I'll call an inside eater? Okay, so 
These are, that's, this is the Bangladeshi cohort I talked about before, and this is presented a different way. This is just a heat map of the bifidobacteria and some of the other microbes that are present in the poops of those kids. And the only point I, I make out of this slide is the darker and darker the bifidobacteria get, the more and more abundant, the less and less you see it, anything else. It gobbles up all the space. There aren't other organisms really present. Now, this is a relative abundance, but we've analyzed absolute abundance as well. And this turns out to be true. Bifidobacteria are dominating this niche, just like they saw in the children 100 years ago. So I, I like to think of bifidobacteria, in, this, uh, in these kids, it was mostly B infantis. I like to think of bifidobacteria as sort of the chipmunk, right? It stores the food or sequesters the food away from other, other organisms to eat. All right, so this is what happens in a kid dominated by bifidobacteria. What happens if a kid's colonized by an outside eating bacterium? Well, it turns out piglets are colonized in a different way. So we could study that. It's easy to get pictures, cute pictures of piglets, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, this is a paper we published a couple years ago by a former postdoc in my lab by the name of Steve Fries, who made some really pivotal discoveries on this mechanism. This is, again, these funny stack plots of nursing to weaning piglets, and all the different colors mean are just different bacterial orders that change from nursing to weaning. And one of the things you can notice right away is if you look at the colors of the nursing one and you look at the colors of the weaning one, you can, with, with your eyeball, you can tell those are different. So something happened. And, and piglets, uh, unfortunate for piglets, get weaned in a rather abrupt way. So one day they're on the, on the teat, and literally next day they're not. And they wander around and cry and fight until they realize that they can eat this other food that's there. So it's a very somewhat cruel uh, weaning, but it's really great from an experimentalist standpoint because it's a very abrupt change. Obviously with human weaning, we don't necessarily do it that abrupt. So in this case, you look at the organisms that are we were interested in the organisms that were consuming these oligosaccharides in human milk, these, these, these large amount of fiber that's in human milk. And we were trying to figure out who they were by seeing who went away with weaning. So you look at this plot and you ask, which colors kind of go away when you make this transition? And one of the organisms is this one right here, oops, which is uh, Bacteroidaceae, this Bacteroides. Late. Okay, that made a certain amount of sense. That's one of the organisms that can degrade these kinds of oligosaccharides. Now, I'm going to tell a little story about one of the enzymes we studied in this pathway because it helps prove the point I'm going to make. We're going to focus on the sialidase here. So just trying to cleave this diamond away from this circle. So we were looking for that enzyme. We actually sequenced all of the, of the DNA in the poop. And that allows us to see all the genes from all the microbes that are there. And we can ask the question, where do we see this enzyme? This enzyme, is, or this kind of oligosaccharide is a human milk oligosaccharide. And the kinds of fiber from plants are different. They don't even have this molecule here. So we should be able to see sialidases in nursing piglets, but not later. And that's exactly what we saw. So this is the pathway for consuming that silic acid. You have to cleave it off. You have free silic acid. You have to transport it into a bacterium. And then you have to consume it. So I don't need to get into the specifics of the pathway other than to say this is, this is what you have to do to consume that silic acid. The genes representing this pathway were really highly abundant in nursing piglets and not in weaned piglets. So that makes sense. The, the weird part was Bacteroid allies represent this enzyme that allows you to cleave the silic acid off. The rest of this stuff was in a different clade of bacteria, the Enterobacter allies. And so you go back to the, this plot and you notice, yeah, this, guy go, this green guy goes away. That's the Bacteroid allies. And the Enterobacter allies is the black one. That also goes away upon weaning. So I like to think of this as Perhaps there's cross-feeding going on. Perhaps Bacteroidales is cross-feeding another population. Right? 
And this is all just observed. We're looking at DNA sequencing, so we're making guesses, educated guesses, that, that this is what's going on. Um, we've actually studied this a bit more. Uh, we've sliced and diced a piglet uh, from, from snout to, to the other end uh, and looked at how milk gets digested all the way through. And just to bring out one point, the organisms, or excuse me, the oligosaccharides don't change until they get down into the colon. And all of a sudden they start rearranging. The pools look the same until they get to the colon. As soon as you get to the large intestine, the colon, you see a lot of these organisms that can chew up these oligosaccharides. But remember, if the Bacteroides is cross-feeding the Enterobacter allies, which houses E. coli and other clades like that, you would expect it to be further downstream. So when we measured the feces, all of a sudden you see a whole bunch of Enterobacter allies. So that makes sense. You know, GI tract doesn't necessarily move in the other direction, right? It moves in one direction. So you'd expect the food to flow downstream. So that biogeography helped us. There's been a bunch of papers that have been published since, including ours, to suggest this kind of cross-feeding happens. And in, in one case, it's actually linked to inflammation in the intestine because you're enriching a group of organisms, proteobacteria, that are, have been associated with inflammation. So does that mean these kids are at risk if they have the wrong microbes in them? Well, that was a question we wanted to ask. Does this happen in infants? Do we have this Bacteroides breaking this up and giving little pieces outside of the cell that suddenly another E. coli can swim by and consume? And so we wanted to understand that. And there's a population of kids who desperately need research on their GI tracts, and those are premature infants. And premature infants, uh, of course, uh, are, is, a, is an increasing problem, and, and these kids are very fragile, and their org the organisms that colonize their GI tracts are nothing similar to a term-healthy baby. It's, it's as if they get everything from the hospital inside of them. Um, one of the correlations they noticed was that the clade of organisms I mentioned that were enriched with this cross-feeding, those were the organisms that are correlated with uh, necrotizing enterocolitis in these children. So necrotizing enterocolitis kills uh, a good number of the children that are diagnosed with it. And that unfortunately, the current diagno uh, diagnosis is a, is a bloated belly like this. Um, they, you, 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 you respond very quickly with antibiotics and things like that. So we wondered, is this, is the, these are all kids getting breast milk, so is the milk being consumed in a, in a way that somehow allows this to happen? And that's one of the things we wanted to ask. So we, we started examining breastfed preemies. Now, we got a cohort of, of preemie poops, from uh, a colleague, Erica Cloud, from uh, University of Chicago. And she had some kids that were either going on to be healthy or going on to a stage they called pre-necrotizing enterocolitis. And of course, once they get necrotizing enterocolitis, there's all sorts of interventions. You throw antibiotics at them, you might do surgery. And, and so you can't really study the child after then. At least you can't study the feces from the child because antibiotics, of course, are going to change the microbiota of the feces purposely. So she was looking at, is there any signature in the pre-neck samples that would predict why the kid got necrotizing enterocolitis versus kids that went on to be healthy? And so we wanted to ask the question, do we see this correlation between Bacteroides and proteobacteria? And that's exactly what we saw. Kids that were on their way to necrotizing enterocolitis had a whole bunch of Bacteroides in them. Bacteroid allies. And we looked at it a bit further. We sequenced that poop, and we looked at the monomers in the feces of that poop. So we asked, for instance, is fucose present? And other monomers that would be the evidence of the release of these sugars inside these kids. And that's exactly what we saw. So we see fucose in higher abundance in the kids that went on to get necrotizing enterocolitis. So the, the crumbs of the outside eaters 
are being left behind in these kids. And then the question is, is another organism that causes necrotizing enterocolitis coming up and taking advantage of that food niche and growing? Um, we sequenced the DNAs again, and that's exactly what we saw. We saw this same relationship we saw in the pigs, except in this case, it's a different sugar. In this case, it's fucose. So we think these children are being benefited by, by being able to consume breast milk. There's no question about that. Lots of studies have shown that premature infants do much better on, on human milk. But maybe their microbes in their gut haven't developed uh, the way a term baby would develop. So maybe, maybe there's a way to solve this problem by putting the right microbes back in. Um, so uh, one of the things that we noticed by, we, we actually purified a whole bunch of these proteobacteria out and we tested and sure enough they grew on the free fucose and they didn't grow on the big oligosaccharide. So in other words, they had to have it free. All right. If we know that the proteobacteria are eating the fucose, and that might be a cause of this necrotizing enterocolitis, uh, can we prevent necrotizing enterocolitis by putting another organism in there? Well, in a sense, all we need to do is put a bug in that can either eat free fucose or eat fucosylated milk oligosaccharides, and maybe it can outcompete for that food inside a baby. Well, it turns out that study's been done. A whole bunch of probiotic studies have been done with kids uh, in the in premature infants, kids in the NICU, uh, to try to determine, do any of them prevent necrotizing enterocolitis? And in general, probiotics uh, are, are, are looking pretty good uh, at benefiting infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. But we knew a little bit more about uh, which genes we think were important. And we thought genes associated with being able to consume fucosylated oligosaccharides were really important. So we asked the question, of all the probiotic trials that, that existed where we could get an idea of the genome of the probiotic that they were using, um, we could ask the question, well, if a probiotic had the ability to consume fucose or consume fucosylated oligosaccharides, did it do better in that trial? And that's what we did. And that's exactly what turned out. If the probiotic that was used could consume fucose, uh, the, and you, you reanalyze these old trials, it did much better. There was one uh, problem in this, in this study, and that was one uh, trial used B. infantis, which we know consumes these human milk oligosaccharides like crazy. And it didn't work. It didn't prevent necrotizing enterocolitis. So that we, we, you know, we were confused by that because all the other data lined up really well. And it happened to be this product. And it's one that people probably have heard of before, a line. Uh, it's called B. infantis here. And so we were confused uh, until we actually looked at it. It's actually not B. longum subspecies infantis. Uh, and it turns out the, the folks who discovered it published a paper uh, last year saying, oh yeah, it's actually B. longum subspecies longum, which of course in, in, in our hands doesn't grow on many of the human milk oligosaccharides. So in a sense, it's a negative control for what we were doing. Um, so our breastfed kids around the world colonize the same. I pointed out before that kids in the developing world seem to have a lot of bifidobacteria, and we consider that healthy. And, and are other kids around the world colonized by what I would call these outside eaters? Well, here's a plot of kids from around the world, different cohorts. Again, these are these stack plots showing the different microbial clades, and bifidobacteria are in green. These kids are all about the same age. None have received antibiotics. All are breastfed. There's mixtures of C-section versus vaginal delivery here. The average two-month-old <laughs> Breastfed kid, healthy breastfed kid microbiota is different around the world. That's going to consume milk differently. That's going to help the child consume milk differently. You know, you have on one end, you have sort of the, the chipmunk, and on the other end, you have the cross feeders. 
We've also done some, some additional studies. On one end, the pH is much lower than the other. So could you take an organism from the chipmunk side and put it into a child from the other side and get it to dominate and maybe make, put that kid at less risk? So to summarize this, we think milk is a great model to try to understand how to, how to feed the organisms in your GI tract and modulate them. It's a very hot topic in science today, is trying to understand how to manipulate the gut microbiota. The glycans that are in milk are really driving that microbiota development. And understanding the very specific interactions between the microbes and the glycans help you understand how a gut microbiota gets established and who's feeding who or who's not feeding who. Uh, and then you can start to associate those different patterns with healthy or, or less than healthy kids. So we can start to translate this knowledge and move it out in hopes to try to first and foremost get it into kids in the NICU. So. With that, I want to thank the students in my lab, uh, and particularly some of the uh, former students in my lab are listed here in, in red. Uh, and some collaborators I've been working with for many, many years, uh, and of course, all the funding that we've had. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you much.